friends and listeners, and welcome to a well a new format. Hello, Ike. It's great to have you here as well. We are doing some new experience for the first time here, the kind of thing that we announced about what is it six weeks ago? Yeah, just about now, and and I'm I'm very excited for our um our uh, our first episode. This is very special to me. I'm I'm glad to be here, and we've we've got some excellent. Uh, guests today absolutely and for those who are not on video i think we have to explain so arcanum podcast the great arcanum podcast and thos hermes podcast are starting a series of common podcasts once a month i think we are gonna gonna run that a kind of double interview with two guests each time and yes as you say we have two great guests here today do you would like to introduce the, the two sure our conversation today is with Phoenix Aurelius of the Phoenix Aurelius Research Academy. He's a practicing alchemist, uh, an educator, and a researcher. And with Daniel Wiseman of Secret Fire Apothecary. He's also um, an excellent, highly lauded uh, practical alchemist, researcher, and educator. And what's really going to facilitate our roundtable discussion, I think, today is that uh, Phoenix and, and Daniel are not only colleagues, but they're friends. Right. And still they are a bit of two generations, almost. I, I think uh, Daniel being the younger of the two. And that makes it also interesting because I think we will see the development in, in practical alchemy. And what I also be curious to hear, because I think normally, and many of our listeners don't even think of that in the first place, because of course, like me, they're not specialists in alchemy. The difference that there is between alchemy and spagyrics, I mean, it's not, it's not the same thing in a way. And I think we're going to explore that quite a bit. Yeah, and and it's it's great because they, you know, since alchemy really is a part of the broader. Um, esoteric tradition I mean both Western and Eastern it'll be really nice to hear from two people that have a background in uh, in in not just alchemy but broader traditions as well both East and West and and you know not to delve too much into <laughs> sports commentary here but they're guys at the at the, the top of their game right now you know they're on the cutting edge they're doing work um, and they've they're very very hungry for what they do and and i really it, it's inspiring to see people who, who practice at this level mm -hmm. maybe we should give our listeners here some some practical advice because as it is a first uh, they have to discover so this podcast uh, and the ones that will follow uh, uh, those common just joint ventures that we are doing together will be broadcast on both our channels on all the outlets that you I use for the Arcanum podcast and on all the outlets that I use on the Thoth Hermes podcast so you can spread the word widely and we will really hope that that you are all going to enjoy this if you want to give us some feedback use the regular things use the feedback that you're used to have for Arcanum podcast or for Thoth Hermes podcast and we'll exchange them don't you worry you will reach both of us when you write to either of us about this podcast, don't we? <laughs> and, 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 and I think we, we should also keep up you. Uh, you ask me for that. I can, I'm happy to do that. Uh, we take up the musical tradition of the Thoth Hermes podcast. So we will play some music to hear today as well. Absolutely. Yes, that's one of my favorite features about this. I don't really do that on, on the Arcanum podcast, and it was it's definitely one of my favorite things about the Thoth Hermes podcast as well. So maybe we could, uh, we could start with our musical intro. Yes, absolutely. So let me explain what is going to come. Right, so this month's music choice is from here in Europe, uh, not actually from here in Vienna, but from Norway. Lefty and the Tin Can Sellers is the project based around the Norwegian songwriter Kjell Anders Hotvet. And besides him being a songwriter and singer, Kjell Anders Hotvet is an organic farmer, a writer and poet, and he is also one of the fans of the Thoth Hermes podcast, and he has sent me the music a couple of months ago, and I'm very happy to give it to all us here tonight. It's 
very nice. Uh, um, Kjell's um, background is in education, literature, philosophy, Latin and ecology, and his music is inspired by folk music from every nook and cranny of the world, and the lyrics is bent towards esoteric mysticism and folklore. So listen carefully to what you will hear. And the first song that we hear is named Ocean Floor. Ocean Floor by Lefty and the Tin Cancellers with their lead singer Kel Anders Holtvedt. There's a sliver of light in the crack of dreams That reminds me of the evening When the queen of every love and ease Gave the earth back to Meaning. In the journey through the gleaming, you cannot walk alone. There's a door in every meeting, a creek swans, then it's gone. It's a slippery hand I'm holding, you cannot. Hold as long as the war of thoughts keeps raging, a hundred legions strong.
Well, welcome to our first roundtable discussion uh, with myself, Ike Baker, and my distinguished podcast partner, um, Rudolph Berger of the Thoth Hermes podcast. Um, Hello there. Yeah, it's it's great to be here with you, Rudolph. Um, hopefully this will be the first of many. And we've got um, a couple of excellent guests uh, that we're going to have a conversation with this evening. Phoenix Aurelius um, of the Phoenix Aurelius Research Academy. He's a practicing educator and alchemist. And uh, Daniel Wiseman of Secret Fire Apothecary, also a practicing alchemist and an educator. I'm really thrilled to be among this company this evening. I think we're going to have a, a, a great conversation. It's a great moment to kick it off during equinox of spring, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great to have you all here and um, uh, also to have two alchemists who practice. And we will hopefully find out during the conversation uh, also the differences between your approaches, if there are any. And it's always, I think that's the interesting thing when we do those double talks that we have people who are on the same line, but not quite, and may, might show us what differences could be and also should be because that that's what makes life interesting and and more 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 colorful so how do you know one another um, daniel i mean i came across phoenix's work in my very early days into alchemy and spagyrics probably at least a decade ago maybe pushing a little bit further i'm starting to lose track of time but um you know phoenix i think is um quite prominent, especially in the North American spagyric tradition. So his work was kind of front and center when I started leaving the books and getting into the online community. He was one of the first people that I came across, um, watching some of his old podcasts and checking out what he had on his social media. And, uh, and then it wasn't until, you know, a few years later, we shared some banter back and forth online on a few subjects and eventually phoenix invited me on his show and uh yeah the rest is history i guess <laughs> yeah like he said it's like uh 10 years ago so this would have been probably like the early facebook groups if i remember right insta wasn't really a thing at that time and i remember that all of the Yahoo groups from like a decade earlier had all kind of fizzled out by that time of actual practical alchemists, like having back and forth conversations. That's how I learned so much though in those early days. And so I always wanted to contribute as much as I could for other folks as I learned more. And I was contributing pretty heavily in those days to those Facebook forums. You'll, you know, to turn turn the phrase that Ike mentioned earlier, uh, it's rare as hen's teeth that I will actually post much of anything these days because it got highly contentious, as most things did over the last three or four years due to global situations. But um, before that, it was, there was this kind of golden era of really great people who are, who are posting a lot of high level things. And so there, it was really awesome. One day as I was making posts or just kind of scrolling through there, I saw Dan Wiseman's stuff coming up and I was like, this guy, he's put in the time. Like I can tell that he knows what he's talking about. And he was coming at it from angles that were absolutely unique and that other people weren't talking about. He still does. I think he's one of the the pioneers of modern alchemy, especially like he, he said for me, especially in North America. But um, yeah, I, I was just really, really wholeheartedly impressed. And so, like he said, we had some, some discussions and sharing thoughts and possibly even minor arguments or whatever online for a little while. And then eventually invited him to come on the podcast uh on the alchemical trip podcast and that's when i was like this guy is top notch I, I mean i already knew that but like the the information he has and how he presents it is fantastic so a lot of respect for dan likewise likewise yeah that's that's uh that's really nice i'm, I'm warm and fuzzy now <laughs> well well yeah you, you know the thing the interesting thing for me as rudolph mentioned earlier I do want to get into how you both are unique. Um, and I think that I have some idea about that, but I'd like to hear your own thoughts, right? I mean, it's that's kind of interesting when you put somebody on the spot. Uh, so I, I want to get there. But first, let's lay a little groundwork here. Um, we Phoenix, you mentioned the modern alchemical scene. Um, 
when do you think modern alchemy, like when, when you conceptualize it now, and as you've used the term in conversation, when do you think that really began? And what would you say are the keystones of the modern alchemical community, or a, or a, maybe a better word is paradigm? Sure. Well, being where I'm at in Utah and having the experience that I've had, my reference point for where the modern alchemical kind of community or where the term modern alchemy really comes from. Um, and this is a very American answer. If you're in anywhere besides maybe America, pockets of Switzerland and Australia, you will probably have a much different experience than me. But I would say that when Frater Albertus first opened Paracelsus College, that would have been the first time that we really saw what modern alchemy was, the way that we look at it and conceive of it today. Uh, the way that like um, Robert Allen Bartlett was taught and his, his predecessor, of course, being Frater Albertus, the way that they were taught was just a very unique offspin off of the Rosicrucian work that was being taught at San Jose, California. And um, I think his name was Orson Graves was the guy who taught the alchemy course uh, within the uh, Amorc tradition. And he worked with Frater Albertus actually for a while. And it was when they closed down the alchemy lab of PR or of, of um, at San Jose Rosicrucian Park. Frater saw that there was a need for this work to be continued. And he, he, as story was passed on to me, ended up opening that up. And then he taught such a wide variety of people in the 24 years or thereabouts that he had his doors open that um, he was definitely reaching a huge number of the people that have created written works that we have stuff available from today in the English language. And so the way that I see it was that Frater kind of began this community. And then after them, the philosophers of nature uh, with Jean Dubuis uh, work, um, which was uh, translated by Patrice Malese, a couple of Canadian guys. And they ended up creating um, a kind of an echo chamber of those very same principles in the lab work, like uh, everybody who was part of both schools says that the curriculum was basically the same. The tradition was basically the same with few peculiarities thrown in there by Jean Dubuis, you know, own mystical experience or whatever. So um, the way that I see it and my experience with it would say that it kind of began with Frater Albertus in the early days of Paracelsus College, extending through Paracelsus Research Society, and then with Philosophers of Nature. Uh, and kind of dying with uh, philosophers of nature, too, when they actually, you know, got rid of the egregore of philosophers of nature. It was the death of something for a while um, inside of the al in, in, in the entire alchemical community. There was a, a real need and a sense for culture that suddenly just dropped and was not available. And it took a little while to pick that up. And it's still not as cohesive as it was in those days. It was a really cool moment, snapshot in time, as far as I can tell. So anyway, that's my answer. You have to bear with me to be the, the European voice here, because of course I I have that being over here, I have that, that point of view. Um, would, you, would you see, Daniel, a major difference in approach or in, in history on you on the east coast where you are in canada in particular then from maybe utah and uh, the history coming from amark and from the west coast has the development been parallel or being the same or do you see any difference on that side of the continent i think phoenix described it well i think really there was a bit of a, <clears throat> an echo chamber created in this new modern paradigm where everybody was essentially teaching the same things whether It came from Frater Albertus or Philosophers of Nature or uh, Manfred Junius as well, who, of course, isn't uh, on the same side of the pond as us. But you see the same thread of teachings um, with some tweaks, just like Jean Dubuis had his Europe European influences and had some other, you know, unique material. Um, I feel like it's very similar. You know, my my paradigm or what was available to me and to Phoenix, I'd say that the big difference now, if I could expand upon our modern paradigm is 
now we have the internet, you know, and so the internet, although there's been a big void for, you know, uh, long, long lasting schools, um, the internet has created this new era, which is contentious, as Phoenix mentioned, which I think it's, you know, it's a little bit awkward sometimes, but I think it's, it's an important phase of the modern paradigm, because now we have a lot more debate. And it, you see that a lot between um, people who are um, very much aligned with traditional alchemical thought, um, and then the new paradigm of like spagyrics as per Frater Albertus or Manfred Junius or, or now Robert Bartlett, you know, a, a continuance of that thought. You see a lot of clashing uh, in between people, which, you know, is, is not always great. Um, but I think when it's done respectfully is a really important part right now is, is comparing and contrasting these traditions, finding links between them and, and really validating um, where these ideas came from, like what's new, what's old, um, where do they meet in the middle? I think there's a lot more meeting in the middle than maybe some people would have you believe. Um, but I think that's an important part of this new paradigm is, is, is the internet where so many people can connect over this, you know, there's Facebook groups like the alchemy study page, which I believe has over 40,000 people on it. Right. So now we're into a phase where alchemy is more available to the world than any other time. You know, we have so much resource between networking, uh, and reference material too, you know, because there's so much published material that, you know, nobody at any other time had access to. So we've got this, um, you know, this common modern problem of uh, information saturation. <laughs> we have so much to distill down and to, to try to understand what is the truth of this matter. And of course, there's lots of strong opinions uh, in that. And that can spark some really great, great debates to kind of hash out what's true and, and what's false, which I think is really what alchemy is all about. I, I wanted to piggyback off of a point uh, or some terms that you use there, because I, truly I'm, I'm very interested in it. As you might have, may or may not know, I've, I've looked into the history of it and um, of alchemy. It's extremely fascinating to me. But, you know, I think, I think Phoenix and I have described it as the fever dream forest in the past. It's, it's labyrinthine and it, it can be very, very confusing. But if you had to, maybe for, for our audience or for me, uh, if you had to compare and contrast, well, let's start out with contrasting. I think that's the best way to really distinguish them. How, what are the major, I guess, bullet point differences between the you know, contemporary and the ancient alchemical paradigms? Like what, what defines the work you're doing now as opposed to the things alchemists were doing, you know, maybe four or 500 years ago? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> and I'll start it by saying that my personal take is that there are many, many hallways to the same room. So again, I think there's a lot more convergence of idea or should be more convergence of ideas than these ideas opposing one another. But if you look at the, the essence of the contrast would be traditional alchemy is generally focused on a polarity of two different things or those two polarities being split into the four elements. Whereas more modern alchemy uh, as Frater Albertus taught it and all the other people that kind of sprung from that are focused on, you know, the Paracelsian idea of the Tria Prima. So you've got, you know, one system that's sulfur and mercury, these opposites, um, and then sometimes split into the elements and then the tria prima. Uh, um, so that, that to me is probably the main difference between this traditional versus more relatively new uh, paradigm of alchemy, at least since Paracelsus. And w would you say, Phoenix, that um, what you described as this well, new paradigm and which happened over the last few years and the discussion that Daniel mentioned between those two groups is still on a discussion on that same difference or is there anything else that the last years or the last 20 years let's say have brought to the discussion something that has become even more different than those two ancient differences so to speak sure yeah so yeah i think 
to be perfectly honest with you, the same amount of evolution in alchemical thought and ideas that happened between 1530 and 1960 happened between 1960 and about 1990. And I think the that same amount of growth has probably happened in the alchemical community starting around 2007 till maybe about 2015 or so. It was, th it was that same like several hundred years of alchemical thought and evolution was now speeding up to this, which then kind of sped up this way. And right now, I mean, my head is spinning all the time. There's no possible way that I can keep up with everything that's published and everything that's posted on various alchemical groups across all different social media platforms and online sources. I mean, it is really insane to see how many different practices are are coming up and people are actually bringing their own thing to it for better and for worse. Um, I think the better thing is that it drives diversity and it's going to drive tradition. And just like anything, when there's, you know, when something gets oversaturated, certain colors still make their way to the surface. They might be darker than what they would be otherwise, but they are still very definitively colored one particular way. And so, you know, the cool thing is, is that there's a lot of diversity to the art right now. The possible thing that we see, though, is dilution as the negative aspect of that is that some of the more traditional ideas and concepts are, I can't say they're losing hold because it's still the vast majority of what's being used, but it has this kind of adverse um, parallel form that is is getting developed and uh you know to a certain degree this has always happened but when people are very fresh or very green to something they start teaching it without fully really knowing what they're talking about there there happens to be a sense of like dilution and insertion of ideas to fill in the blanks of what you know their own perception is of this thing instead of kind of connecting it more to what is the hermetic lineage of this and how am I passing on these more kind of like lineage based ideas. So, um, yeah, there, there's both good and bad, but what I see about it right now, what kind of my stance on it and how I'm dealing with that is that I'm starting to just call my work. Like this is Aurelian alchemy, meaning that people will know that that comes from my tradition and I'm teaching this. And this is just one tradition of many different traditions that can exist. Uh, same thing with the concept of Aurelian Spagyria and the alchemical works and the Spagyric works, you know, they're similar, but the idea within, again, Aurelian philosophy, my philosophy would be that alchemy is more a path of self initiation into nature, whereas Spagyria is a medicinal application of the alchemical arts and sciences with a, a broader kind of medicinal art foundation to it. But that's not everybody's stance, and that's not everybody's state. The material manifestation of the spiritual work, would that be a term which fits to Spagyrics? Yeah, I mean, realistically, the spirit and the soul, the, the spirit and the psychological work, the spiritual and psychological work are happening with the physical material all the time. So, like, you know, when as alchemists, that's what we're trying to do is use our lab work first to be able to serve as a model for, for those changes that nature makes to be able to learn from that. But in that, this, the material that we have that we're working with is a spirit, a soul and a body. And those correspond to some aspect of our spirit, soul and body. And so when we're opening up, say materials in a plant or in a mineral, you know, the more fixed the material is that you're working with, you tend to have a more serious or more archetypal type of deeper archetypal effect um, on the individual. And it begins to change, at least in my experience, looking at this and, and performing alchemy with this intent, by the way, um, my experience is that we end up kind of changing aspects of ourselves or transforming aspects of ourselves in direct relationship to the materials that we're working with, at least if we're open to that concept. And that's what really differentiates alchemy from Spagyria, in my opinion, in, in a certain regard, is that Spagyria is done with an attitude that everybody can take this, this is for everybody. And it becomes somewhat of a, I don't, I don't want to decrease the value, but it's somewhat of a 
primitive chemical approach to um, making things. And it's not really that primitive. So I don't know why I want to say that. I guess it's just a non-pharmaceutical kind of approach to it. But um, alchemy is more of like you're you're using your work to help comprehend the spiritual, psychological, and physiological significance of the transformation of the work at hand. And in my opinion, that if it's done correctly or done with good amount of awareness, it elicits those changes. So I, most of the modern alchemists that I know of kind of approach their work in a somewhat similar way to that or would have a somewhat similar philosophy. Although there are plenty who also do have like a Golden Dawn based tradition or other things like that, where it's like a Rosicrucian tradition where they're also, you know, doing what is called spiritual or psychological alchemy. But for for any practical alchemist, it's really merged. It's not a separate practice. And eventually, hopefully, we just learn how to carry that into other aspects or all aspects of our life, that same type of state of awareness and significance. Uh, so that's, I like that you, um, that, that was one of my questions was going to be for you. What is, how do you define Aurelian alchemy? And um, I think that you set it up really nicely there and, and incorporated this idea of body spirit soul the tria prima uh kind of correspondences there um that that daniel mentioned but i'm interested now daniel what do you think is what is secret fire apothecary all about what is what are you doing that's unique um in the modern paradigm how do you define your work well <clears throat> i mean a big part of my work is clinical and i think that kind of speaks to the conversation we're having right now too is that there's a uh, I think a big effort in our modern times to share, which is quite different than say the traditional history. It's, it's a lot more open than it has been uh, throughout the history uh, of alchemy. You see, you know, more people coming to light that want to teach uh, or they want to sell their products to people who want to better their health with these things. So, I mean, my background, like I come from a clinical perspective, I'm a clinical herbalist. So, you know, my initiation into this really was about um, creating, uh, you know, a working apothecary with spagyric and alchemical medicines that I can use in my private practice. So that's one aspect of it. Um, I think another unique aspect of it would be research. You know, I'm heavily, heavily involved uh, and interested by validating alchemy with our modern tools and methodologies, I think, in my experience thus far, uh, the ultimate sign of truth is when philosophy and science are entirely congruent with one another. And that's been the biggest eye openers for me in my path. And, you know, it ruffles feathers and makes other people excited. But, you know, trying to use the best of what we have around us to, to validate and further our, our path, I think, is what anybody would have done along this path. If you look at the writers of, you know, all these traditional writers, they were using the scientific method to the best of their ability as well. Uh, and they were using it alongside their philosophical or even religious ideas as kind of like their, their tether to the path that they were on, you know, they may have this deeper uh, spiritual um, purpose behind their work, but they were not afraid of using science as far as um, they could at that time to validate their results, you know, repeating things over and over again, using just observation, taking really great notes and, and seeing what things really added up and what, what things didn't. So I think that's something that I'm really focused on. So it's not really a new idea, but I think in a lot of ways it is because our, our, our tool belt has, has expanded quite a bit since, you know, a thousand years ago. So the ability to analyze what we have in the third party lab, you know, to say, what are we really creating here? Um, what works, what doesn't, what are some misconceptions, um, which would be ob obviously there'll be misconceptions when we had limited tools, um, in the past, um, you know, just really sorting out what what um, what survives the fire. <laughs> In this case, the fire is is analysis. You know, um, certainly I'm not trying to disprove alchemy. And the more and more I pull modern science into my practice, the more and more it's validated um, 
you know, by, by this type of research that I'm doing. So that, that to me is, you know, is really the fire, uh, underneath of me that keeps me going is, is research and, and validating, um, these different methodologies and what they can produce. And, and in particular, in a clinical sense, why is it that these methods, um, make such effective and powerful and often quite safe medicines? Like what is it about the chemistry of this philosophy and laboratory practices is, is so special and unique from, you know, modern pharmacy or even a lot of, um, you know, modern herbal medicine? Well, of course, the Rosicrucian tradition often speaks of the secret fire. So did you take any, did you take any, um, well, did you take it from there? Let's be blunt or did you did you develop your own thought about it uh well i took it from a lot of sources i think that's a big thing that stuck out for me with secret fires that um you know it's it's mentioned from so many different paths and often it's mentioned with with you know different names for it but for me it's the essence of of what we're doing it's like the reason why it's the thing that's animating everything it's this it's this universal principle that is making everything go and giving you a reason for why you want to be alive and pursue whatever it is you're pursuing whether that be alchemy or anything else in life uh, so i thought you know what is more important than that that animating spark of existence you know that's to me the most important thing perhaps about this work is keeping your eye on that prize so my my thought is this right as somebody you know i'm a, a ceremonialist and i know you both have background in, in that kind of stuff and to your point earlier phoenix on uh, the point of on, on initiation and the idea that the spagyrics are you know the these medicinal preparations um using the principles of of alchemy are for everyone are they do they contain a potency that is i guess comparable to what the the uh, initiatic alchemist might undergo you know like are do they have any sort of initiatic uh, uh are, do they catalyze that experience so, so let's just say if somebody were to take some of the the spagyric uh uh tinctures and things like this these preparations would that then catalyze the species of initiation for themselves or is it strictly kind of a an anatomical you know biophysiological sort of thing well my answer to that is i guess you know i i have to answer that a couple of different ways within my philosophy the goal is when i'm making a spagyric tincture over here to not include anything other than the intelligence of the plant. I'm trying not to put myself into there as the operator. I just want to have the highest vitali vitality that I can and be able to know the processes so fluidly that I can help that plant express itself in the most exalted way that I know how. And so I'm trying to leave any initiatic effect that that material might have to the plant itself. And I do think that plants through the spagyric art have the ability to convey their messages and their initiation to the individual. And also the item of pharmacopoeia that we use has different initiatic systems to it as well. So like uh, this would be the second part to my answer is that if I give somebody a spagyric tincture, that's probably going to be more physiological. If somebody takes an essence, that's going to be more psychological. If it's going to be like a uh, fermented essence or something like a magistery, where the mercury seems to be the, the vast majority of the, um, the constitution of that particular remedy, then that's going to have a very mercurial effect on the individual in terms of working on their spirit and things like that. So depending on the item of pharmacopoeia and what percentage sulfur, mercury, and salt are in and what form they show up in, um, I think really determines how that remedy is going to work. There are also things known as initiatics, which are specifically designed by the practitioner to create an initiatic experience. So there's a lot of different ways of answering that. And I think it really depends on which item of pharmacopoeia and who the pre 
preparer is and what their intention and or kind of ritual preparation of it actually entails. Phoenix, you mentioned uh, Golden Dawn before. We were talking about Rosicrucianism and also, of course, like uh, like Ike, I'm also ceremonial from 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 on that end. Um, there is a, s a certain school in those those teachings that says you have to do things with your hands. You have to make your wand. You have to create things with not only with your spirit, with your thinking, with your with your but with your body, with your hands to prepare things physically. Um, how does that teaching compare, or maybe I should broaden that question, how does occultism as a scheme, pre um, how does it um, compare to what you just said about the difference between spiritual alchemy and spagyrics? So is could one say that preparing uh, a medicine is like creating an object that you need in ceremonial magic, for example, or does that not compare at all? Is this a completely different concept? I can only answer, I guess, for myself, but in general, the way that I teach the tradition that I pass on is that that would be more of the alchemical work. I would compare the alchemical work much more similar to the preparation of ceremonial magical things because you're imbuing it for you. This, uh, you know, nobody is going to be using your ceremonial tools besides you, hopefully. Um, and so you are putting yourself into those tools um, in the same way that like a bladesmith who's talented pours himself into the blade that he's making if it's for himself or a loved one. It's like that type of thing, right? Um, and that seems to be more of the alchemical path. For me, you, we do things in alchemy because we are undergoing an initiation. And so even if the work is a little bit sloppy, if you're investigating it for the first time or, or trying to put multiple different pathways together from different authors and kind of, you know, spin off and do your own thing, um, it can be a little bit messy, but it is definitely something that you're pouring your entire love into your entire self into for that discovery. You know, you put into things what you you're, you get out of things, what you put into them with the alchemical work. I find myself and teach others to put themselves into that work wholly because then you really get a tremendous amount out of it. You're a totally different person by the end of the work. If you're paying attention and actually doing, you know, using quantum state of observation throughout the process. That being said, um, the spagyric work we try to keep ourselves out of. So I, I would compare spagyric work in a certain regard to somebody who's an alchemist and knows the work like the back of their own hand can step into a spagyric lab and do this thing as a daytime job. That's That would kind of be the way that I approach this. Um, yeah, I think, well, I agree in essence with everything being said, um, <clears throat> at the same time, I feel whether it be spagyrics or alchemy, the thing about this, the thing that one of the things that drew me to this is, is, is the holism about it, the holistic aspect of it. There's, you know, of course there's separation of things. We can separate the individual, um, endeavor from the more communal endeavor, we, we separate all these parts of the substances, uh, but we know that they're, they, they're, they're made from one thing. And in the end, they're going to go back to one thing. So in the end, it could, I think the lines get a little bit blurry about, um, you know, the individual approach versus a more communal clinical approach, um, you know, is a medicine more physical or is it more, um, you know, psychological or even initiatic? I think that all of these factors are kind of always at play. And, you know, the, the operator, I think is maybe the, one of the first steps of how you can kind of direct this work, you know, based on your intentions, right? I mean, if your intention is to create uh, a purely uh, initiatic substance for yourself, or even others, maybe in a private group or something like that, of course, you have that ability as the operator to, to, to fine tune the process for that. Um, 
but in the end, um, even the most, you know, individualistic efforts, I, I find they're mirrored in, in the work of, of sharing medicine, right? Medicine is a, you know, it's a spiritual endeavor, I think, in the end, uh, when you look at the root of, of illness, uh, regardless of whether you're helping a neighbor uh, get rid of their annoying headache, uh, or dealing with something, you know, more obviously deeper, in the end, all of our ailments come from a deeply spiritual place. So I think, you know, we can separate these things in some sense uh, to, to make sense of it and to talk about it and also to, to, to program our work in a certain way. Uh, but in the end, I feel like it, it's a bunch of streams, you know, leading into the same river. I said earlier, different hallways into the same room. It's, it's unavoidably uh, spiritual and physical and, and emotional and individualistic and communal uh, all at the same time, which is, I think, really what I love about alchemy is that that holism it, it's it doesn't go too far really into any of those individual pieces because without including everything then it's not alchemy right if you if you if you remove an essential piece of it then you're missing a, an essential ingredient right so you're you're going to fail at some point so um yeah it's it, it's a difficult question to answer in, in some ways um because it's 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 yes and no, it's up and down, <laughs> left and right. It's, it's, it's polarized, but it's all one thing. Um, so that's kind of my, my take on that, you know, cause for me, like for an example, like I'm focused um, largely upon clinical work. So sharing uh, medicine with people or sharing uh, even research with people. Uh, but of course, um, as anybody who does this work knows, as you do this, regardless of whether the, the attention may be to share with other people, like you, you go through your own individual trials and tribulations along the way. Uh, I feel like it's an un, unavoidable part of the work and also something I love about it because it's, uh, you know, very, very busy, uh, like Phoenix mentioned at the beginning. And uh, it's so great to be able to get um, my work done and my uh, spiritual work done all in the same motion, you know, everything is kind of feeding back to the same, same place. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And, uh, um, I think about it a lot, actually. Okay. And now we are taking a musical break and this musical break brings us back to Lefty and the Tin Can Sellers with songwriter Kjell Anders Hotved. And the next piece we are going to listen to is called trail of breadcrumbs and as you might remember for those of you who follow sauce hermes um i will immediately announce also the third song which we will play after the end of the second part of our roundtable talk on alchemy here today so the third piece that we're going to hear afterwards again by lefty and the tin can sellers is called seaweed so once again, now, trail of breadcrumbs, then we carry on with our interesting roundtable discussion. And at the end of that, you are going to hear Seaweed once again by this band led by Kjell Anders Hotvet. Stakes you did walk. 
Like a scatter on birds, like a pack without hurts. All my thoughts are on us back. The wind, there's a faint drop of sin from your hair like within. It's being carried on by snow. In wind, the trail made of breadcrumbs was eaten by mice. What mistakes you did was you must surely do twice. What's been guiding my head through this snow-crested land is a rumor. From beneath the sand. I love the fact that um, Rudolph mentioned, you know, having to make stuff by hands, because even you, you look at Zosimus of Panopolis in the third and fourth century CE, before, you know, alchemy became an actual term, he called it kairokmet, which mean which meant things made by hand, and I, I love, you know, the correlation, especially Phoenix talking about. Not not putting too much of yourself into the the preparation. It's very similar to magic, um, you know. Not putting too much of yourself into a divination, not putting too much of yourself into a you know, talismanic stuff is is very important there too. That's why I'm I'm a firm believer that you shouldn't make talismans for other people because there's going to be some some kind of energetic connection there even if you're doing some sort of thing where you're having an angel kind of consecrate the thing there is no way to, to separate you know to th there's no way to have 100% uh you know f contamination free sort of thing so with that said like i'm able to understand what you're talking about because i have this magical background so my my question for the both of you now you know more conversationally is sort of twofold I know both of you have been explicit that you've practiced Golden Dawn sort of stuff and you, you at least the tradition. Um, and I'm very interested to know how that maybe prepared you for the work or if it didn't happen uh, precursor, as a precursor, how did it expand your work? And then the second question would be, um, 
you know, where do where do energetics fit in for you? Do either of you have any kind of, you know, uh, energetic practice, qigong, things like that? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, for me, um, really things kind of happened at the same time. So my involvement with Golden Dawn came at the same time as I was, like, I had already started studying both alchemy and um and magic and and you know the esoteric in general prior to this but when i really dove in um you know i was studying herbal medicine i was studying spagyrics and i you know had recently been initiated into a golden dawn temple so it was happening all at the same time uh, which was great i was get, uh, it was you know an intense experience and and really um you know it it it, it was a big pivot point for me in my life because it, it, it took over. It's, it was my all day, every day, in my dreams, when I wake up, all day long, I'm doing one or all of these parts of the work simultaneously. So for me, like the interplay between, let's say, influence of Golden Dawn versus, my, you know, my alchemical studies, um, you know, I, I'm a very science-minded kind of person or, and even more so then. So I was really picking apart the bits and bites of spagyrics and, and alchemy and figuring out how can I pull this into my, my clinical practice? Like, how can I make this part of, you know, my apothecary practice to, to make really effective medicines? So I was focused a lot on, on the practical aspect of the work. But then, of course, at the same time, you know, I'm going to this Golden Dawn temple and, and looking inward, um, you know, and, and sharing these, this type of experience with other people and, and, so I was getting, again, a good interplay between like, okay, I'm doing physical work and, and, and honing in my lab skills, but at the same time, the, the deeper underpinnings of the, the meaning of the work, not just the how, but like the why uh, was being highlighted by the Golden Dawn work, right? And of course, I mean, it's not the same for everybody, but I had a really great community around me at that time. Everybody was, you know, focused on the mysteries uh, very, very communal and friendly, very open to, um, you know, merging these paths. I think at that time too, people felt like alchemy maybe had, had lost um, its grip in a lot of these different magical orders, you know, that perhaps in earlier days that this was an absolute um, prerequisite for this type of work to have, to be doing this internal work and also this external work at the same time. Uh, so I think there's a lot of hunger for that, uh, at least in the group that I was in, to to kind of connect the dots and and bring um, alchemy back into this work, um, not just in a, you know, like the way that Jung uh, approaches it as like a system of psychology um, or mysticism, but you know, actually bringing physical laboratory work into it um, to add to our tools, like was mentioned, you know, making magical tools. Um, I think everybody, you know, understood, even without maybe having experienced it, that it was obvious that alchemy could produce substances that would be very, very useful uh, in, in, let's say, the Golden Dawn tradition or, or any other ceremonial magical tradition. Nice. Yeah, and I guess, you know, for me, it was something that I felt obligated to learn so that I could speak the language of a lot of Frauder students. Um, so I didn't really get that interested into um, Golden Dawn work until maybe, because I was practicing spagyrics for two years before I even knew it was part of the alchemical tradition. Then I started studying. That would have taken me to about 2006 or seven. So yeah, I, I didn't really start studying alchemy until about that time. That was the first international alchemy conference. And shortly thereafter, I would hear all sorts of people at the conferences and at other like Yahoo groups referencing, you know, the four equals five degree or, you know, just all sorts of random type of uh, esoteric. You had to be in the know in order to understand what they were talking about. And so for me, it became a very intellectual pursuit of going through that. And I think it was 2009, I inherited um, an entire library that had all of the Golden Dawn uh, materials from her local temple that she was at. And all of the, I mean, I have a tremendous amount of books over there. 
um, especially authors who were part of the Golden Dawn tradition who went on to teach various things about Kabbalah and um, other related things. So at that time, I kind of got into it, but I very quickly, I mean, it didn't take me a whole lot of time to realize that I'm not a big fan of 19th century occult reviver, uh, occult revival type holdover magic. I did never find it effective to the greatest degree, at least in comparison to the magical forms that I'd already been practicing for years up to that point. And so I was just kind of highly critical of it, to be perfectly honest with you, and didn't really enjoy it. And I had to sift through so much of it just to be able to understand the references that a lot of people were making. It was um, my, my time with most esoteric orders has been kind of frustrating that way, to be perfectly honest. The Rosicrucians, Golden Dawn, things like that. It's it's a it's a fairly common complaint, you know. Um, I would say it's about a fifty fifty split, you know. People really are into it, or they're really like, I don't get this. I love the essence of it, though. You know, like the the background of it is like all of the things that I thought I was getting myself into by like joining, or and then I quickly found out like actually I already have a lot more insights just by using some of the framework from like Jean Dubuis courses in understanding Kabbalah in the lab and the tree of life in the laboratory, even though I have to admit like a lot of his framework cannot be <laughs> replicated or, or necessarily taken a look at as being absolutely scientific in the majority of cases. Um, his ideas on that served as an excellent framework for me. And I felt like I was getting a lot more from that self initiation than I did from any external esoteric order because there was just, I was guiding it. I was the one, like, if the work worked, then that was proof of the initiation to the next phase of the work. And if it didn't, then I can't move on. Like, I, I have to redo this. I'm still in this process. Something I just thought of, too. <clears throat> you know, I, I share your frustrations, and I think a lot of people do in modern times. And, you know, it's not to put down the essence of these groups or anything. Because, yeah, I looked at something like Golden Dawn, and I... I thought, okay, this is a whole bunch of subject matter that I'm really interested in. And look at all these pivotal characters who are part of this group or part of groups that came before it or after it. And obviously there was something attractive there. You know, it really, at my time getting into it, really, I wasn't a, let's say, believer or anything. It was more academic for me. Like, why do all these important people spend all this time in these places? I, I was curious, you know, and a lot of the <clears throat> you know, I had encountered a lot of these aspects of, let's say, Golden Dawn work before, but something that I found right away and what was interesting about my experience at the time was that my deepest experiences, not all of them, but most of them happened outside of the Golden Dawn Temple. And it was because I was merging my work with alchemy and Im imbibing substances with the work. And not to say that that is a prerequisite or anything, uh, but I think if we look at the history of, of, of you know, these hidden traditions, um, they almost always have something that you're taking. You know, if you look at look at the, the Greek mystery schools, right? One of the longest lasting traditions where everybody wanted to go and drink the kaikion. Uh, there was ritual. Of course, there's all this aspect of ritual or ceremonial magic, all these, you know, pieces but it all centered around something that was imbibed, you know, and I think there's something to be said about looking to nature um, for aspects of nature, which are maybe further ahead in their evolution than ourselves, right? When you look at the perfection of nature in plants and minerals and metals and, and how we can manipulate them to make them humanize and make them, um, you know, usable by the human body, like, to me, like those are the true elders of, of, of this type of wisdom. It's, it's not just people. And of course, people can be elders too. And I've learned so much from people, but the number one teachers for me have not been human. They've been, they've been plants, they've been minerals, they've been metals. And I feel like the combination of these systems, uh, whether it be magic or philosophy or any type of esoteric thought combined um, with you know, these strong leaders of, of plants and, and, and metals and minerals, that combination to me, I've, I've, I've never 
witnessed a single system that separates those things as being more powerful than the parts combined. Again, back to the idea of alchemy, right? Pulling all of the parts together, um, you know, gets the best results. And that's certainly the way it's been for my experience, at least. That's, that's very interesting. Um, I wonder if either of you, or maybe both, uh, you can tell us what, where does the continentally European alchemy and spagyrics world stand nowadays? Is it very different from North America or is it on the same scheme or do you have any experiences with that contact with people over there? Yeah. Um, so I have actually trained a number of people who live in Sweden, one who lives in Greece. Uh, I have a lot of colleagues um, in France, actually, uh, David Niop Destelier. Uh, um, we also have, jeez, uh, I don't know. There, there, there's actually quite a few different colleagues that I can think of. Uh, Alexander Diener, who is in uh, Switzerland. So the... And the traditions are actually very, very similar, especially because, you, you know, we have to go back to the late 19th century, like 1880, basically. And we take a look at all of the different esoteric orders that were forming the biggest Rosicrucian and esoteric movement that actually made its way to America was happening in France. And it was uh, definitely the Kabbalistic order of the Rosy Cross or the KORC that had the largest number of participants in that same vein who were studying the works of like Fulcanelli and actually performing a lot of work. And that's the tradition that kind of made its way to America during the, the ninth or during the 20th century, um, especially through the works of Jean Dubuis. But you can see that even Frater Albertus's tradition, which had, according to Rubafila Salfluer, originated with Alberto Pancaldi. And Pancaldi was in Switzerland and had that same type of French KORC influence. And so we find that there was kind of a very similar tradition. And even though Europe just in general takes things on a more serious level, everything like, uh, I don't know about your work, Daniel, but like my work is like, I, I had no credentials. I didn't have millions of dollars behind me to start my practice like i was bootstrapping everything and learning as i go and starting my own business out of necessity because there's nobody who's going to hire a spagyrist that was not something back in the day that people were looking for um so yeah for me it was definitely like i had to find my own way and in europe a lot of these guys they come from traditions where they got interested in something who had been passing it, you know, in, in somebody's tradition who had been passing it on for a long time. They tend to learn from those types of sources. And then it's a passed on tradition. And it's something that is also done as a business with kind of more or less communal support. Like there are people who know about it inside of the community and um, they tend to support it more. So that being said, there is a lot of younger folks in Europe right now who are practicing alchemy and a lot of them are just like living out of a van or, you know, like living van life or whatever they call it these days and um, doing things like that. And so there is a lot more of that kind of American influence in Europe from my perspective at the present moment, but it seems to be much more on lockdown in, in Europe too, especially because in Germany and Switzerland, for instance, you have the electro homeopathic pharmacies that are, you know, essentially doing very alchemical things, if not the exact same way as the American tradition, but they're selling electro homeopathic remedies in, you know, apotech in, in the apothecaries and stuff. And so it's, um, it's just more serious in Europe. <clears throat> I've spent lots of time in Europe and, and have been blessed with making many contacts in different parts of Europe. And I would agree that, um, the European side of this seems like it's more of a unbroken tradition. Um, you know, it, a, what we're, a lot of what we're learning from, of course, came from Europe, you know, maybe earlier before that Middle East or even, you know, North Africa or, or Asia. But um, it, it's obvious to me that there's more lineages of unbroken tradition. I think they, if you go back to, let's say, the time of 
Frater Alberta is trying to learn things a little bit more difficult. Uh, you know, you the more I hear about, you know, Frater Albertus's early days, it seemed like he was quite frustrated with trying to find good teachers early on because most people were entirely focused on like psychological alchemy and he felt like they had most streams had lost the laboratory practice. Um, that being said, um, knowing how secretive many alchemical groups can be, I think, you know, going around knocking on doors kind of thing, it, it might be a difficult way to, to get into some of these more secretive and continued lineages, right? Because now, now we see as things start to open up more, um, we see that there are some unbroken lines of, of people passing down laboratory alchemy in Europe. Um, they're just coming to light a little bit more. So we, we don't have that here as much. We've had to kind of forge our own path. You know, it's something that, you know, wasn't here as far as the European alchemical tradition. Um, you know, Frater Albertus really, I think, is the person who opened up that door. And, you know, he did the best with what he had. Um, and But most of his work was spent, you know, it seems like most of his time in the alchemical field was more of what he had created and, and, and going with the life of, of, of what he initiated himself rather than, okay, I spent, you know, decades and decades studying under certain tradition and here I have the complete system and, and uh, here it is. I think he had to do a lot of back engineering. You know, it seems like he obviously had a very good understanding of the basic principles. And although he may not have had the initial teaching that he had hoped for, um, you know, when he was, you know, left Germany and then he went to France afterwards and he was searching for um, people to learn from, it's, at least from what I've read and what I've heard from people who knew him, um, he didn't really get everything he wanted to. So, again, he had to focus a lot on, on kind of back engineering these ideas, you know, rather than coming from an unbroken tradition, he was creating his own. So um, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of criticisms about that and some founded, some unfounded. Um, but that is really the big difference, I think, between, say, the Americas um, and, and Europe. It's that this is a relatively new thing here where it's a little bit more unbroken uh, when you look at Europe in general. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an interesting point, though, you know. Um, to kind of combine what you, you had both mentioned uh, earlier about you know different lineages and traditions in terms of magic versus alchemy or 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 in terms of what what you were more called to and along with this idea of of having to try and make your own way i think a lot of what we're and i'd like to hear your thoughts but i think a lot of what we're trying to do is tap into a particular stream of consciousness and and i think a lot of what we you know we need to sort of have a degree of consonance with the thing that we're looking for. And, and we're able to sort of um, find the threads, find the clues that bring us to where we need to go. Now, I personally, I, I tend to think that a lot of, a lot of our, our story arcs are somewhat providential, especially when you begin engaging with them in this way, you know, and, and, and in an enchanted world and things like that. But I think that it's possible to tap into something, even if you don't have a teacher necessarily. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's completely impossible to tap into somebody like that who's, who's you know, um, running all over Europe and really, really sincerely trying to find the tradition. It, like you, you kind of mentioned, Daniel, there, there's some criticism about there being gaps and him not trying to, you know, him not being able to get everything that he wanted, but but having to sort of retrofit or, or kind of... Um, put his interpretation on the thing. I think that that can really be an effective way to transmit, but also evolve a system and kind of keep it, you know, as long as you have the nuts and bolts, the basics, and you know what you're doing, I think that can be a really interesting way in which these systems sort of providentially evolve. I mean, does that, does that make any sense? Or is that a complete non sequitur? <laughs> I think I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's something that helps me keep going when you're you're lost in this sea of information and you're you know diving into like who's right and who's wrong and gets a little bit cloudy. I think what I try to remember is that this is a system of following nature. 
at its, you know, so regardless of what book you have, what person you have teaching you or anything like that, the truth of it is all around us all the time. It's inside of us all the time. And I think there's something to be said about having this genuine, it's like a childlike experience where nobody's held your hand or anything. And you're having direct experience with like the revelation of truth relative to your own personal journey with it. Right. You know, when you don't have it all laid out, you know, on a silver platter for you and you have to go find it yourself, like it hits hard, you know, and sure along the ways. And like, I think we've all probably had those moments where we have what we believe to be an epiphany, which maybe 10 years later, we might look back and laugh at that epiphany and think that wasn't really much of an epiphany at all. But I mean, in that moment, it was pivotal and it changed you, you know, and then you move on and you, you, you evolve further and, and, and um, go deeper into your experience. So I think, yeah, there's something to be said about forging your own path and, and having this more direct experience, you know, when you're, you don't have a teacher to ask you uh, and you're just, you have that like undying urge to uncover the truth, you know, nature reciprocates, right? And, and, and we all have our own, you know, individual way of, of uncovering these secrets, but they're there for us everywhere, all the time, inside of us. You know, there's, there's no uh, uh, lack of resource when you tap into that particular way of learning. And I think there's something special about that. I, something something that's interesting uh, for me is having to do kind of um, what you were talking about just now uh, in terms of this reciprocation um, or this reciprocity in, in nature and something that you said earlier about your best teachers being um, uh, being plants and minerals and things like that tying back to maybe like the Rosy Christian perhaps uh influence on uh you know them them being highly highly inspired by paracelsus i mean if you can say one thing about ro- early rosicrucianism is very very influenced you know to heal the sick and that gratis using using magical means as palliative as as medicine um for the soul there's this other concept too that you know phoenix mentioned the intelligence of plants in in certain magical paradigms, where the Rosicrucian lineage specifically claims that you know the Rosicrucian order extends you know its visible people and invisible entities, and that includes things from the highest you know uh, aspect of that ontological chain. Talking about you know things that would be considered angelic or archangelic, and things all the way down at the lowest level, you know. I don't know. I don't know how low it goes, but you know, it, it struck me as 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 being really powerful. That yeah, because even on the magical side, when you're not necessarily um, imbibing things or, or taking things all the time, we we believe ourselves to also be under the tutelage of of you know angels, diamonds, you know gods, and things like that. So there is, you know, nature. I think one of the beautiful things about our traditions is that it. It can it can encompass so much more, you know. It, it's 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 a hierarchy that not only descends into visible nature but invisible nature. So I just I, I, that kind of struck me, and I, I thought that would be uh, something to contribute there. Yeah, I, I also thought that it it sounds very much to me. I don't know if I'm right to the to this life what you what you mentioned, Daniel, to 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 the and not to the beyond in a way so it's it's very much oriented into practice and here and now is that is that correct or do, do did i misinterpret you yeah i think it, it, it's this uh it's definitely a here and now thing um but although that reverberates maybe before and after who we are where we are right now um you know i think it's all connected of course but yeah i think it speaks to the experience that we're having you know we are we have this universal spark of life and intelligence that animates everything crammed inside of this individual unique body and and the pairing of those two things creates this very unique experience of of something uh universal so i think yeah there's a here and now aspect about that for sure and i think you know like ike was saying too like whether you're 
whether you're imbibing something uh, or not doesn't really matter. I think we're, we're surrounded by this intelligence of nature. And when we open ourselves up to it, like inevitably we we will meet it um, where we need to, um, when we need to on our own personal journeys. I think it's just an inevitable aspect of it. S- same thing back to the question about initiatics, you know, healing is initiatic, right? Whether it's a headache or, or, or something, you know, like a horrible, life-threatening illness or injury or something like that healing is initiatic and i mean again it speaks to this premise of alchemy where we are removing these impurities removing these obfuscations of the truth of the matter and and whether we be uh let's say deeply into like ceremonial magic or religion or philosophy or anything like that we could be a totally you know materialistic person i think inevitably when you when you start clearing pathways let's say by taking a medicine um in the body you know you you start to to clear the bathroom mirror a little bit inevitably you have initiatic experience because you're you're opened up to truth and and reality in a way that you were not before it's like you know you fine-tune your radio and therefore more flows in or it flows in a different way and and you know whether you you know would label that initiatic or not um you know, I think in essence, that's what it, what it really is. That's what I love about this system too, is it's, it's, it's so natural and it's so holistic. Um, you know, I keep coming back to that word. It's, it's, it doesn't matter which angle we go at it. <clears throat> um, in the end, it, 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 it has the same effect. I think it changes us. Well, healing means becoming whole again, right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. I'm interested to hear Phoenix, uh, maybe you can go first, but how do you think, and this, (laughs) this might be a little controversial, right? Um, it's not always put, not always popular to, to sort of insinuate that communities can, can improve, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you think, uh, the community of practicing alchemists, modern alchemists, how can they best continue to grow? and improve you know or at least from your from your vantage point um what are you trying to do to facilitate that and what are you seeing as a response right now yeah well for a long time i mean the we the alchemical community has been a weird thing because it's grown so much since i first got into it and there was a point until maybe 2018 or somewhere around there where my goal was to get everybody together to be able to create a single system of standards that could be used because there were so many folks learning so quickly from sources that were questionable sometimes at best or that had information that maybe was not agreed upon by the vast majority of existing practitioners. We all tried to kind of look out for each other and give people um like a heads up, it's like, hey, a lot of people can do what you're doing. Maybe you shouldn't be doing what you're doing for a reason. Like there are a lot of reasons why we may not want to put, say, oils of metals available online just to anybody anywhere. And there were a lot of concerns. And that that got so misplaced for a long time that it drove like a wedge and some competition um, inside of a lot of different groups and it, it, things got highly contentious for a little while and everybody was disagreeing quickly. I realized, well, this isn't sustainable at all. And so my whole mission and vantage point changed, which was how about I just create my tradition and then whatever is going on in the broader community at large, they can do whatever it is that they want to do. And in, in my tradition, I love opportunities like this, like listening to Dan, learning from Dan, listening to John H. Reed, learning from John H. Reed, listening to, you know, Robert Bartlett, learning from them. I like as many different perspectives as possible. And so that's what has led to me creating kind of my own synthesis, my own tradition of things. And that can be a lineage for my students if they want it to be. And if it's just one flavor of the multiple different flavors that they're going to experience in the alchemical community, then so be it. I mean, that's that's absolutely fine. But at least they know where each different part of the teachings that they want to assimilate kind of came from. And there's also going to be historically 
a bit of a definition as well and some context for that because we don't always have that when we look back at history today alchemical history we don't always know like when a group of followers started following one particular way of things we don't unless there was like a very particular text or author that they were using we don't know how to like trace that back and so both for historical context as well as just to be like okay cool whatever is going on out there that's fine here's going to be my tradition my lineage if you want to learn this way i'm here and i think that that's going to kind of be the future of a lot of things whether formally spoken or not formally just the way things are going like you always hear about in the United States, it's like I learned from Robert Allen Bartlett, I learned from Sage of Popham, I learned from Phoenix Aurelius, you know, I learned from Inner Garden, I learned from, you know, all these different sources, John H. Reed. Um, yeah, you, you'll hear different types of things like that. So there already are these lineages anyway. I'm just trying to make it maybe a little bit more pronounced and then bringing standards to my own way of, of doing things, my own approach, my own answer, my own. Daniel, where do you see the thing going? Or would you like to see going? Um, again, I feel quite similarly to to, to Phoenix. Um, I think that it's important right now, if we want to bring alchemy out to the world, out of the shadows, and, and really see what it can do when it's when it's available uh, in a way that it never has been before. There, there needs to be checks and balances. There needs to be um, a standardization to a, some sort of degree. Uh, I'm an eclectic person, so I'm never going to vote for one single standardized system that like there's only one way to learn alchemy. This is the way it is. It's such a vast subject, alchemy. It's, it's like to say you've got all the answers for alchemy is to say you've got all the answers about life, right? I think many hands make light work and we need to have many different opinions and many different approaches to, to really, again, tease out what the truth is. But in moving forward in today's modern paradigm, if we don't want alchemy to be pushed back underground through, let's say, um, well, there's dangerous aspects of alchemy, like, like Phoenix mentioned, you know, you could have toxic products, especially, especially if you're working with metals and minerals, but also even with plants as well. So I think there is, a need to standardize that aspect of it, whether it be quality assurance standards or also just standards of operation and understanding of like how this works and why this works, why this medicine for this and not for that. Um, so there's, there's a depth of clinical practice with it too, that I think deserves standardization, even down to very simple things like, you know, how much of an ingredient is, is in this preparation that I'm taking. If I take, five drops of this, what's the equivalent, uh, you know, raw ingredient or active ingredient, like, you know, I think standardization is, is, is necessary to, to, to research properly, to understand the full benefits of this and to really analyze it under a tight scope. Uh, and then there's the safety aspect of it as well. Um, and also to hand it down, hand something tangible down to whoever comes next, uh, in all of these ideas, like, to have something like a really strong framework to, to start with so they could build upon that and involve it even further. You know, I think right now, um, I think in the last, whatever, let's say hundred years of alchemy, uh, it's been a lot of labor trying to uncover like super cryptic, poetic, symbolic, like all these, there's so many layers of hiding the bare bones facts of alchemy right and I, I think that we're entering a time of revealing where it's naturally starting to come more out in the open uh, in order to take the next stage in its evolution whatever that may be so standardization uh, i think is a really really important thing and, and just just for the record too you know to have again something really strong to start for anybody new to it to start from to either critique or build upon or, or validate further, we, we need really strong data. Um, and, and I think it's, we're creating it maybe for the first time, because before it's all scattered, it's different practitioners of different ages, different parts of the world, no internet, much more difficult to travel. Like there's all these impedances to like a shared body of knowledge. And now we don't have any of that. So 
to create that, even if it's multiple systems, like Phoenix has his system or, you know, Robert Bartlett is teaching his, which is, you know, very, very open in my opinion. There's, there's many different schools of thought, but I think to standardize whatever uh, school of thought you're coming from, uh, to put it on the record, to compare, contrast, build upon, um, is a really important part of, of making this available to the world right now. And it's a very unique uh, opportunity that Alchemy never really had before. And we are really grateful, both of us, to have you had with us here to, to start off with this new joint venture that Ike and I <laughs> have decided to try out. And I think... Uh, we're looking forward to what's coming in the future. But thank you so much for being with us here today. And uh, um, uh, it's been great. Mike, what do you think? Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, both of you guys. Thank you, Rudolf. Um, if you do have any um, uh, websites or anything you want to point people to, I think now would be the time. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so for anybody who's interested in my work, you can go to phoenixaurelius.org and uh, hopefully there will be a link down behind there because not everybody spells that right on the first take. <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, yeah, phoenixaurelius.org, you'll be able to find out about the research that I do, the calendars I put together, all of the products that we make, uh, classes that I teach, different types of things like that. And um, if you enjoy our mission, what we do, feel free to support us. We're we can always use that because alchemical work and spagyric work is neither cheap nor easy. <laughs> and so all of your funds definitely help. Thank you. Uh, for myself, you could find my work at secret-fire.com. Also on social media, on Instagram, I have a more personal page, uh, alchemia.arcadia. And then I have my business page, Secret Fire Apothecary. So you could find my work there. Uh, I teach classes and offer a lot of products and services. And you can find all of that uh, on, on any of those uh, platforms. Great. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was a wonderful opportunity. And thank you for all of the awesome thoughts that uh, you also shared today. Dan, I always learn just as much from you as I do from being on and listening to everybody. I mean, it's just, it's a really fantastic exchange of ideas. Likewise. Thank you. And there's only one thing I would like to add. Take care. Stay tuned. Hear you soon.
So stars been bright at all. The mirror of it all will shatter and the pieces fall. 